Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. It is Thursday, which means it's time for another awesome webinar here at Marketing Profs. This time it is performance marketing, how to do more with what you already have, sponsored by Drift. I am Joe Roberts, uh, Marketing Profs Director of Training Products, and I'll be your moderator today. I am excited to introduce Monique Lemieux and Caitlin Seely. Uh, Monique is head of marketing ops at Drift, where she owns the strategy, alignment, and performance of marketing operations to help the marketing organization grow revenue through operational efficiency and data-driven insights. Uh, Caitlin is a high-growth-focused marketing leader specializing in digital marketing, integrated campaigns, and analytics. She is the head of digital marketing at Drift and leads the charge on digital marketing and channel performance. All right, it's time to kick off today's presentation, Performance Marketing, How to Do More with What You Already Have. Monique and Caitlin, it's time for you to take it away. Thank you so much, Joe, and, and thank you for everyone for joining. I'm really excited to talk through this today because this presentation hits on so many topics that Caitlin and I talk about daily, um, if not hourly, on the marketing team here at Drift. And uh, it's just something that we care so passionately about, and I can't wait to share some of the things that we've been talking about with everybody. Uh, so just a few things that we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to kick it off just benchmarking. How do we measure performance? Uh, what are the actual KPIs that we should be talking about here? Caitlin's going to talk about how you can identify what's working and what's not, so you can actually figure out you know, how do you optimize to make the most out of what you have. And then we'll give a few actionable tips for maximizing your ROI. So let's just get right into it. This is why we're here. Uh, performance is front and center within our organizations, our ELT, our board, all of our stakeholders. They want to know what is marketing doing and what are the results and why are we giving so much money to marketing? Where is it going? Um, I think internally, when as marketers, we spend so much of our time trying to figure out what more can we do? What new offers can we launch? What new messages should we come up with? What new landing pages can we create? You know, so much more. The point is that we're spending a lot of time and a lot of energy creating and trying to reach our buyers. But in reality, a lot of the time, we are not necessarily getting the most stellar results. Uh, of course, there are exceptions to that. You have your, you know, five or so campaigns every quarter that just like, knock it out of the park, really, really great results. But you might have a lot of sort of middle of the road performers on your offers and campaigns that deliver mediocre results that we've just sort of been accepting and moving on from uh, because we are stretched pretty thin as marketers trying to do a lot. So what we want to talk about today is how do we actually get more out of what we're doing? How can we double down in certain areas of success without actually adding more resources, without adding more budget, without trying to find a new um, channel that is a silver bullet, you know, those don't really exist too often. So it's difficult sometimes to try to innovate a lot with the existing budget and resources that we have. So the first step to that, I think, is figuring out how do we measure performance? What does success look like? And this is probably going to look very, very different depending on what type of program or offer you're running. Um, there are certainly programs where your success metric is going to be something related to the top of the funnel. You've got a brand awareness campaign or a lead acquisition campaign running, and your goal might be generate leads. We need to get a ton of stuff at the top of the funnel. The name of the game is getting our name out there and generating at-bats for the sales team. Um, but you're not going to try to measure yourself against all of these same performance metrics for that one program because you are going to you really quickly stretch yourself way too thin, trying to check off all of these boxes. Um, and it's important to understand what that success metric is first before you even launch your campaign, because you don't want to launch something and say, yeah, this is going to generate tons of revenue, tons of pipeline. But really what it's doing is impacting the top of your funnel and acquiring some new leads for you. Um, I think in reality, uh, there are tons of brand awareness plays that we run, and they can almost be perceived as not, not failures, but uh, less than stellar success because it's not immediately resulting in revenue at the bottom of the funnel. But that's not really what's going to happen anyway. So setting the stage beforehand, kind of rallying everyone around what is the North Star metric for this program, this campaign, this offer, uh, and being able to say beforehand, 
this is what success looks like. And if we do hit this number, then we hit our goals. And if we didn't, then we need to go back to the drawing board and actually optimize a bit to try to get to that result. Um, obviously, there are a million different ways that we can measure this. And I put a few in here. But for so many of us, I think pipeline and revenue is so, so important, especially in these days when we are fighting for every bit uh, of budget that we can in order to accomplish our goals. So let's talk a little bit about that stuff at the bottom of the funnel and pipeline and revenue, because it's really easy to then translate that into your return on investment. So as it relates to pipeline, the first step is to define your attribution model. How do you actually tie back the pipeline, the bookings, the revenue at the bottom of the funnel back to the programs that drove them there. And this is something that you could answer this question in a lot of different ways, um, but it's important to decide on one and agree on it cross-functionally before you move forward, because it, it looks very different depending on what type of attribution model that you're using. I've used all three of these different types of models at some point in my career. A first touch model means that when you're looking at all of your opportunities that were created or all of your revenue that was driven in the company, if you look back across all of the activities that happened within that account prior to the opportunity being created, you're saying the first thing that happened in that journey is the one that's getting all the credit. So if somebody came to your website, downloaded a piece of content, maybe 10 days later went to an event, spoke to an SDR, booked a meeting, later turned into an opportunity, if you're using a first touch model, the um, attribution is going to go to that content download because it's the thing that first brought them into the system and the thing that first engaged them. If you are using a last touch model, then the credit might be going to that SDR engagement that happened right before they booked that meeting and saying, this is the thing that carried them over the finish line and was the thing that got them to talk to sales. If you're using a multi-touch model, each of those has some sort of play. You're going to look at all of the activities that happen, and you might use some weighted uh, attribution in order to say maybe 20% of the value goes to the first touch, maybe 50% goes to that SDR touch, and a few of the percentage points get to the last touch. So you're looking at everything across the journey, understanding where it fell within uh, the life cycle, and what is the dollar amount that I can tie back to that. So all of these has pros and cons. Um, every company does it a little bit differently. You might even have a custom model that doesn't fit very neatly into either of these. But regardless, it's so, so important to get that um, cross-departmental buy-in on what that attribution model is and how you're going to measure things before even moving a step further. Because if your sales leaders are doubting the efficacy of your model, or if the marketers are looking at it and saying, this doesn't give me a good view into my program success and I don't see my thing here showing up, then you're going to have a lot of people sort of detracting from it and colluding the overall message of your performance metrics and your success. So define your attribution model, get some buy-in on it, uh, communicate about it very freely and openly across your organization so that everybody knows how do we measure it, why is it helpful to us, and how are we actually using this information to make smart decisions going forward. Um, to give you a little bit of a, an insight into how we do it at Drift, we actually recently redefined our attribution model because it really wasn't driving the best decision making for us. Um, marketing previously was not actually a contributing factor within our attribution model. We were an influencing factor across all of our different um, attribution categories, and it found, it found it really difficult for us to actually tie results back to programs. So we revisited it in conjunction with sales ops, marketing operations, uh, our channel team, our sales leaders, everybody had some, um, some part in actually making this happen. And what we developed was a custom model. We're using a 90 day look back window to say, we have an opportunity that's created. Let's look at the 90 days prior and see what happened during those 90 days. The first touch that happened in that 90 days is the thing that gets the credit. And this is where we're drawing the line in the sand. We picked that window based off of what our average time to convert to an opportunity is after an engagement so that we can actually draw some sort of time frame around it. We don't want to give credit, uh, opportunity credit necessarily to something that happened three years ago if it's not relevant to the actual opportunity lifecycle today. So putting a time window around it, especially if you have a business um, that is you know, more complex between business units and ge geographical structures, it's important to draw some parameters there. 
Um, again, we have shared responsibility between marketing and sales on these numbers, and we have monthly cross-functional meetings between all of the different stakeholders in the department to actually review the results, look at how we're tracking. Sometimes we break that down a little bit more granularly by program, looking at success by channel, maybe digging into individual uh, sales teams or sales performers uh, to actually hone in on the things that are working and the things that don't. So the next thing we do is we tie that back to ROI. I think this is really important because this helps us make uh, very strategic decisions about where we spend our money, where we place our investments. And this is the key to unlocking the insights that your CMO wants to know about. So once you actually have your attribution model or able to tie your pipeline back to specific programs or channels, um, then you can actually look back at your spend, tie it back to the spend and say, here is the actual ROI of that program or that channel, or even just your marketing programs overall. Um, there are a bunch of different things that you can look at within this. You should be looking at how long does it take to convert and how does that change depending on the channel or the tactic? Um, you know, what is the cost per lead or the cost per engaged account that you're driving? Um, how much pipeline or close one revenue does that result in? What are the conversion rates? All of those different metrics are very important because they're the key to unlocking the right channel mix and tactic mix that will get you to results. So when we're going into a planning phase within marketing, this, we call it our spend impact calculator. This spend to impact calculator is really the basis of how we sort of benchmark success and look at our channels and say, all right, which are the ones that are performing the best, which are the ones that relate to fast pipeline, and which are the ones that maybe are better for acquisition and relate to long-term pipeline. And how do we accurately balance those channels so that we have a good mix of things coming in at the top of the funnel that um, provide fast, uh, easy wins, quick opportunities? And what are the things that are driving that maybe take a little bit longer to convert, but help brand awareness, help us spread the word, help us get into new industries or new markets that will set us up for longer term success. So understanding the impact of dollars in uh, to what it relates to in dollars out, it is the key to making smarter decisions within the marketing team. And it's also the key to being able to communicate that success to your executive leadership team, your board of directors, or you know, your finance team that you really need to show some, some um, way to advocate for getting the right budget from them. So tie it back to ROI, that's a very critical piece. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is setting your goals in advance, creating a threshold for performance. It's so, so important. And a lot of times we can kind of forget this piece because we are so focused on the execution and the idea creation and spreading the word about the program. That can be a little bit difficult to remind ourselves first you know, let's check off that pretty simple box of setting that North Star metric um, and communicating it to everybody beforehand. So benchmark your results based off of industry standards or your past results, um, you know, based off of some of the stuff that we just talked about. And then draw that line in the sand and say, this is what we're driving towards. Anything under this number means that we didn't quite hit successful and we want to iterate on the campaign or optimize it until we get to that number. And anything over that means we hit our goal, we saw success, this is something that we could double down on in the future. A uh, couple other tips to make it really easy to check in on performance, just knowing from experience, you know, managing a team of people who um, help with analytics. If people are able to easily access that number in a dashboard or a spreadsheet or, or something really quick, they're not going to look at the number on an ongoing basis, and they might oftentimes rely on others to uh, be able to find that performance metric for them. So make it really easy, build a dashboard, create a report view, uh, could be even simpler than that, just sharing the number every single day with the team so that there is really good awareness around it. And then you can rally the team around the goal and say, this is our North Star. This is what we're trying to accomplish. Let's go and get it. And I think just having an easy way for people to be able to say, yes, this did well or this didn't do well, um, will help focus the team and help provide a lot of that guidance uh, on how to move forward. So uh, I know we've talked a lot about measuring the goals. I'm going to kick it over to Caitlin, who's going to talk a little bit about how you identify what's working, what's not once you get there.
So if you guys noticed in Monique's slides, marketing con our marketing team's contribution to pipeline here at Drift is really high. It's over 51%. So we really want to spend some time in terms of sharing what we've learned in terms of how we've got there. And the very first kind of foundational thing is taking all of this work in terms of once you've determined your attribution model and how you're going to measure ROI, connecting that to what's called performance marketing, which is a type of marketing where you're really leveraging data as your initial starting point when you're developing all of your marketing strategies and really identifying where you're going to invest time and resources as a team. So if you bring me forward, the very first step in this process, kind of, you know, once you've got that attribution model in hand, is to take a second and look at all of the campaigns and programs you're running across your marketing team and align them to their area of impact because that's going to help you figure out which goal you should be connecting these programs to. And as marketers, we always have programs running across pretty much every stage of the buyer's journey, right? Everything from like initial awareness and lead generation to like post-purchase, you know, maybe expansions and upsells. So some great examples, if you're running like a brand campaign and display ads, you're going to look for your goal you're using to measure awareness, right? Is that impressions, web traffic, time on page? If you're running something like an event or an ABM program, maybe that's more aimed at consideration or starting conversations with sales. You're looking more so at like marketing qualified leads, meetings booked, stuff like that. Doing an initial mapping of your campaigns and where they fall in your customer journey is really the first place to start. And that's going to make the second step really, really easy which is to, if you bring me forward one, compare these programs against the benchmarks you've already set up at the top and help with your MOPS team, right? You're already going to have that line in the sand determined for like, what's my historical benchmark and what is my goal? So you can really easily make some quick calls on, hey, this program's working really well. We should invest in and expand this one. You know, this one's maybe performing like as we expected. Could we optimize it to kind of take it to that next level? And third, kind of what are some of the programs that, you know, we tried our best, but they just missed the mark um, and we should do something different. I think this also, you know, really speaks to Monique's point about like, if you don't make these kinds of benchmarks and goals and data super accessible, a lot of people will spend a lot of time at this step in terms of understanding what's working and what's not. If you're working with your marketing operations teams and creating things like dashboards and reports before you launch a campaign, it'll make it really easy for all the marketers across your team to be looking at the same data and kind of picking up on things that are working really well and things that aren't on an ongoing basis. Um, because once you're really able to make that quick call, this next step is where you're going to spend a lot of your time um, on step three here, which is communicating that performance across the team. Um, I think all of us know we have so much data at our fingertips, whether it's in your CRM, your marketing tech stack or other tools, but it's not going to be useful unless you're communicating all of that performance insights with your team and then taking action on it. And you want to be communicating and measuring performance, you know, really regularly across your team. So for example, here at Drift, you know, we have our, you know, weekly team meetings or standups to review kind of the more granular performance week over week, right? But your goal there is to turn that into some quick wins you can make, right? Uh, maybe an email sent yesterday did really, really well. Um, that's a great learning you can apply even like next week to kind of optimize your email calendar and be generating more value. Similarly, you want to kind of be sharing this data with other teams to get their buy-in and support, right, on a monthly and quarterly basis so that you can be adapting, you know, broader strategies and understanding, hey, how might this learning from our advertising program connect to a broader campaign idea we're planning for the next quarter or even your yearly and annual planning cycle? Um, so you want to kind of also encourage folks to not just share good data either. You know, there's really no such thing as bad data. There's always something we can learn from. Um, and maybe you do have a campaign that a couple weeks in, if you're monitoring performance regularly in those weekly team standups, you can pick up on, hey, this campaign's maybe not going down the path we want. It's pretty far from the goal we set for ourselves at the beginning of the quarter. Here are like three things we can optimize in the campaign to bring it there, or maybe we should just be investing that time elsewhere. That way you're not waiting until the end of the month or the end of the quarter to kind of make a call and adjust. It kind of helps you be more agile and really be moving together as a team because you're all communicating and looking at the same data to make your decisions on. Um, and, you know, through all of this communication around performance on our team, we've come to identify a couple of things that work particularly well for maximizing our performance. So Monique and I want to spend a little bit of time here kind of sharing how we've put this into action as a result of really monitoring all these benchmarks um, and communicating that performance across our team. And 
there's not always one great answer for like, what's the number one thing I can do to really be maximizing the ROI from our marketing? Because the answer is it depends. Every audience and business is so different. And the only way to really understand what's going to work for you and your buyers is through testing and testing everywhere in every channel. Um, if you're just kind of getting started with, you know, testing and A-B testing programs, a really great place to start is engagement rate testing. So figuring out how do I initially engage more people in my audience and what are the kinds of messaging, colorways, and channels they're using to connect with our brand or get information that will help them solve their challenges. Um, here's a quick example of an A-B test we ran recently here at Drift related to advertising. Um, you know, we launched a new book and really wanted to get it out there for our marketing audience. And we noticed that something as simple as changing the colorway and kind of the design of the graphics on these ads yielded two really different results. Um, you know, a cost per lead of $18 on the version on the left versus 52 on the version on the right is a really big difference. And we were happy we were monitoring this performance on a week to week basis because we were able to pick up on this really quickly um, and quickly adjust and turn off the ad variations that, you know, just weren't working so we can be more mindful of our spend and our ROI. And once you've kind of looked at engagement, the next thing I really recommend looking at is, okay, you figured out how to get them to click and engage with you. What happens post-click? And that's where conversion rate optimization comes in. And that's a lot of the work that's focused on your landing page experience, right? Your website and also your nurture programs for how you're going to engage with someone after that initial point of conversion. A really great way to kind of test what are the kinds of messaging that's going to work on your landing pages, right? In that conversation with sales, in that nurture is actually conversational marketing. You can use conversational marketing to really easily test things like hooks and openers for your bots to kind of understand, all right, what are the broad pain points that people are resonating with? What are they clicking into and what are they gonna engage with? And similarly, you can ask a lot of thoughtful questions in conversational marketing to learn more about your audience and your challenges and turn that into offers and campaigns. Um, here's just an example of one A-B test we ran recently actually on an ABM playbook. So really working with will highly personalized messaging and greetings and, you know, tailored bot flows work for us. And we were able to really increase our conversion rate into actual meetings booked for our sales team as a result, which is a pretty big win. And if you can do that systematically across your offers and campaigns, all of those increases in meeting rates, right? Lead captures, anything like that can really go a long way to also supporting your alignment with your sales team and thinking about that handoff process too. So putting my uh, my marketing operations hat on, thinking about this question of how do you get actually tactical and, and do more with less, I immediately think of your tech stack. Uh, oftentimes has a lot of the tools and technologies that you need in order to um, test and experiment and then scale up the things that are working well so that there's not so much manual effort putting in um, behind them. At Drift, we have this leadership principle. It's called stay scrappy. And what that means is um, trying out new ideas, testing out new programs or messages, uh, trying to get in front of different audiences and doing it a way where we can uh, be very fast and respond well to changes in the market or changes in our strategy. Um, but I think that you don't want to stay scrappy forever. You want to stay scrappy when you are testing and experimenting and trying out new things. You want to be able to easily adapt to have like a minimum viable product so that you can get things out the door pretty quickly. But you don't want to be in that realm forever. You don't want to be constantly doing a lot of manual work or constantly reinventing the wheel uh, long term. So I think about a good example of this being ABM. When people are launching account-based marketing strategies, a lot of times you not, might not necessarily have somebody who is dedicated to that function within your organization. You might have someone who's sort of managing it part-time, or you don't have the infrastructure within your CRM or your systems or reporting in order to really like full-scale launch something. But if you need to get something out quick, you're going to find some manual hacky ways around it. You might have um, you know, manual alerts that you're sending to your sales team when one of those um, target ABM accounts engages with one of your programs. Or you might have um, email campaigns that you're launching on a one-off basis to reach them. You might have ads that you're testing out, A-B testing, uh, sort of launching things and seeing what sticks. But once you identify what's working and once you identify what's actually proving success in that area, scale it and scale it using the automation that you have available in your tech stack. 
So thinking about some of those same examples, you can use um, automated alerts through your marketing automation platform or a middleware platform, maybe like Trey or Zapier in order to send people automated alerts when those accounts hit your site. You can set up a dashboard in Salesforce that refreshes and sends to somebody every day to see the results of the campaign. You could develop a full-scale like, multi-channel nurture program that triggers automatically when those accounts reach certain stages or reach certain firmographic or scoring criteria. There are so many different directions you can bring that, but I think the key first is to do that testing and actually figure out first what works because you really don't want to spend a whole quarter developing this, you know, super complex automated system with all of these different, um, you know, pieces of it that take a long time to set up and then realize that what you're launching isn't working. You want to spend your time actually getting things out and seeing that success first. And then once you do see the success, then let's double down on it. Let's make it bigger. Let's make it better. And let's automate it for ourselves so that we can move on and ensure that's running in the background. We've got ABM. It's going. Let's think about the next step, the next optimization, the next success. Awesome. And once you figured out, like, again, that step of, all right, I'm testing to figure out what works. And then I've invested the time to really automate it and streamline and make it as efficient as possible to kind of get that word out there. Then you want to kind of really enable the other folks at your company to be getting that message out as well. You know, your marketing key team can't do it alone, right? With kind of marketing campaigns, all of your go-to-market teams can really help you amplify the specific kinds of offers, programs, and campaigns that you know are going to drive the most ROI, right? That's going to help folks like your sales team and your customer success team um, to book more meetings super directly from your campaign, right? And just kind of further its impact. So we really recommend taking the time to you know, write up proper enablement materials for your, especially for your SDRs, but your sales teams and customer success teams too. So they can really understand, all right, the marketing team launched this new book, right? Or this webinar, because we know this topic is really taking off and generating a lot of really quality conversations for us as a business. Take the time to explain to them what that is. Um, you know, don't expect them to kind of mind read your marketing team and kind of understand stuff intuitively or spend a lot of time on your website trying to figure out, out make it really easy for them. And bullets, you know, we use a newsletter we call Helping You Sell that we send out every week as an email to our sales and customer success teams. We can focus their attention on like the top three things going on in our marketing team and why that's going to be useful for you. And then to Monique's point, you can use your existing tech stack or tools like Drift to automate notifications for those same teams when people are engaging with that asset. So if you did launch a new book and it's driven one of your target accounts to come to your website, alert your sales and customer success teams. They can jump in right away and really maximize the super direct ROI that comes from, you know, meetings booked and opportunities. Um, and while a lot of people spend time talking about enabling your go-to-market teams, don't forget about your broader employee and partner base too, right? Um, you know, especially your partner network, that can be a great way to build just like awareness for a product launcher for your brand in general. Um, so leveraging things like email signature banners at the bottom of your email to promote like a cornerstone event or a really specific offer or, you know, pre-writing sample social media posts that your employees might want to share. You know, if you're included in a really big report or running a huge quarterly conference, um, make it easy for them too. Yeah, that's great, Caitlin. Another thing I was just thinking of too, if you're struggling to get people within your organization or on your team to promote things and help spread the word, I think a lot of it comes from your leadership first. So getting that um, that idea of like leading by example from people in your executive leadership team, the leaders of your marketing team, the people who are actually running the campaigns, I think it, it does take a village. Um, but it is easier when you drive that message from the top and when people lead by example. So make sure that you engage your executives and the leaders within your company to help set that example for others. And it will come easier from there. Totally. Uh, another thing that we think about is nurturing to maximize the impact of something. We might launch a new offer, might launch a new campaign. Um, say it's a new ebook that you're launching and you've got paid social ads that are promoting that. When somebody downloads the ebook, what happens after that? And that's often a question I think that, um, you know, demand gen directors, CMOs often ask me is, what is the ideal path to conversion and how are we taking people along that path? 
And eventually you're gonna need a way to be able to answer that question because um, you know, kind of shrugging your shoulders doesn't work forever. So nurturing is kind of the key here is developing some automated ways or set pathways to bring people down so that after they do that one thing that you want them to do, you are continuing to hit them at different touch points in different ways, you know, meeting them where they are about what they care about in order to continue to stay top of mind with that prospect to continue to educate them about your product or your service because you know maybe they downloaded the ebook and they didn't read it or maybe they went to that landing page and they know about that one product but they don't know about the full suite of services and products that your company uh, provides so you don't want to rely on just one touch point in order to capture somebody's attention and convert them into you know the bottom bottom line for your company you want to be able to have a path to lead them down so here's kind of an example Somebody uh, clicks on an ad, comes to the website, engages with the bot that's on your landing page and has a little bit of a conversation. Now, the follow-up might be send them the offer and have some sort of next step CTA. Put them into a nurture program through your email uh, marketing system so that you're sending them related content, um, maybe kind of related to their persona or their industry or the type of topics that they've engaged with in the past. And this is where a lot of the information from conversational marketing comes into play for us because there are so many insights that you can unlock from those conversations that your bot and your SDRs are having on the website about what people care about. So leveraging those topics, the keywords, the different engagement metrics and website page visits that you see within your conversational marketing platform building a nurture campaign around that and using that as the triggers for entry or the triggers to define what type of content you send to them is so, so, so impactful. And we see really high conversion rates as a result. Um, there are obviously a lot of other things listed on this. Get sales enablement involved. Um, maybe having the sales team develop personalized videos that play when somebody hits your site, sending alerts to them when somebody from the account engages inviting that person to a webinar or an event to try to kind of double down on the thing that they were interested in, sending them some other blog posts or news articles that you find interesting. There are a lot of different ways that this can manifest in itself, but I think the bottom line is to have some sort of plan for how you're going to nurture them over time. And nurture doesn't stop at email. There are a lot of different channels that you can have here, retargeting ads, um, paid social, you can target specific people, your uh, playbooks on your website or your, your pages on your website, tailor them to these different journeys um, and you will see a lot of success as a result. Yeah, I can't overemphasize the importance of thinking about what next. Like after that conversion, the last thing you want is for a really great person to be sitting in your database, right? In your email marketing automation platform and not getting a touch point from you. And also just the value of all that data you can collect with the conversations you have, like in a chat with your actual buyer, right? Don't let that data sit there either. That is all the best and most direct information you can possibly get about what are the challenges for your target buyers and how can I really personalize my recommendations for them and also learn from that in your campaign development process. It speaks to how all of performance marketing is truly a cycle where whether you're launching an offer, you know, based on the data you've got about what's worked well in the past, or maybe you're launching a first like full funnel nurture program for the first time to cover that post-click, you want to really be measuring the performance of every step in that nurture flow and optimizing so that at the end, you can develop a really tried and true proven, proven like high performance playbook for the right marketing mix for certain kinds of buyers and audiences and leads that will enable you to kind of apply that same marketing mix, right? to really universally across your campaigns with your existing tech stack. A lot of the times you don't necessarily need new technology to enable these kinds of buyer journeys. Um, and that way too, you can spend your time like expanding over time with all of those proven nurture flows automated and running in the background. Um, you know, performance marketing certainly isn't something you want to do once a quarter or even once a year. You want to really be checking it weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly. So you can kind of always be consistently measuring that data and communicating it back to the rest of your team. Web analytics is obviously important to measuring program effectiveness and marketing attribution. Do either of you have any beginner tips on navigating all of the info that you get from Google Analytics in order to execute that? Um, uh, we hear this a lot. Many marketers just find it hard to know where to start using it as a measure in these kind of situations. 
For sure. I think web analytics is, especially when you think of any channel out there, it's one of the channels with the most, I call it just information and data overload, right? You can get data on any type of action happening on your website before they hit your website immediately after there's a lot there to kind of navigate and sort through. What I recommend is really focusing on the specific data points that are going to matter most to you and the highest intent, like pages and conversion actions and understanding those first. So for example, if you're just setting up, you know, a new website or really just diving into Google Analytics deep for the first time in a long time, right? Um, really determine, okay, what are my highest value pages based on where are our most important products? You know, maybe it's your pricing page, right? Key product pages and certain posts or pages that drive a lot of organic traffic to you and filter all your data to focus on those pages first and really understand what's working for those pages, right? Where is the traffic coming from? You know, what are the channels that are working really well for you there? So you can double down on those. You know, maybe you're finding that you're getting a lot of traffic on your pricing page from a certain referral website. Maybe there's an opportunity to partner with them um, and do some guest content or spin up a campaign there. Or maybe there's an insight you can pull on the kinds of conversion actions people are taking on those landing pages to kind of make those CTAs even clearer and apply them to other important pages across your site. Awesome. So we have a question from an anonymous attendee who asks, I'm relatively new to creating campaigns. So please be patient with this question. Uh, if you were getting a lot of questions about a certain product or service, uh, would that be a good sign to provide offers or campaigns about that particular item? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, this is kind of where you can let like your data speak for itself. If you're receiving sort of like FAQs, uh, I think building a content um, playbook around them is a really good place to start for your programs. So for example, if you find that people are oftentimes hitting your site and um, they're not able to find a landing page that digs deep into like some question they have about your services or they have a particular pain point that they're experiencing often and you're hearing that kind of time and time again, developing um, messages to arm your sales team with around those pain points or those questions is one piece. And I would say that's a really good place to start too, because you don't need to develop like tons of new content and offers around it. I think first arming your sales team with that information is key. And then going back to the drawing board and saying, what are the different integrated campaigns that we have running right now? Where does this fit within the, um, the offer landscape that we have? And uh, what audience is it benefiting? Let's develop some new landing page or some ads maybe around it because if people are often having that question and your website isn't answering it very well, then there is clearly some sort of gap in what you have as you're offering um, that you can actually capitalize on. Like you can turn it into a strength for you. So if you develop a new landing page and it's super well optimized for SEO, like all of those same people that have that question, when they type that into Google, they're going to be directed to your site now. So I would say like, absolutely, I think it's a really good place to start, especially if you're struggling to develop themes for your campaigns quarter in and quarter out um, and need something new to kind of rally your team around. I think it's a great idea. Okay. Um, so here's a question that we hear all of the time here at Marketing Profs. Do you have any tips on creating a library of content for employees and team members to share? Definitely. Um, and that's such a huge component of like this performance marketing concept is really making sure you're enabling all of your other teams to kind of understand what's working really well for your business and kind of lean on data to emphasize like how important a certain offer is or how much interest there is around a certain topic. And that's why you have this campaign going. We recommend really storing all of your top, most important, highest performing offers in one centralized place. That could be like a Google Drive, right? If you're kind of just getting started, it could be something like if you have an internal like wiki or hub, right? Some kind of an internal content system, someplace that everyone across your team has access to. And that's a really great place to store also kind of those explanation docs we spoke to earlier, those kind of briefs for what an offer is and how it works, along with an actual copy of it. That way, while your sales team is, say, on a phone with a prospect who's like, hey, I, I'm really interested in attending this event from Drift. Like, what is it? What can I expect? That information is all super handy for them. It's right there. It's easy to access. Maybe they can even share the link right out to get someone to register while they're talking to them in live time. Um, the key is just putting it in whatever the most central place is 
Um, there are tools um, such as Highspot and others that can enable you to do this with more scale, but you don't really need to be investing in new technology like that as long as you're putting it somewhere that's central to start. Okay. Well, here is a question specifically for Monique. Uh, did you say that you only attribute leads to a single source? And if so, what about all of the other touch points that are critical uh, for that conversion? Yeah, I knew someone was going to ask this and thank you so much. Um, we do not only just look at that one source. We have defined that attribution model that I shared the results of. That's our way of drawing a line in on origination. How do we track back to like the most impactful thing that sort of originated this opportunity or originated this conversation? What was the action that our prospect took in order to get there and show us engagement? And that's so that we can mostly, so that we can report back to executive leadership and our board and say, here's what marketing drove, here's what sales drove, here are the things that we're all doing together in order to impact the bottom line. But it does not negate the fact that it is so important to understand all of those touch points in the life cycle. So we also do have a multi-touch attribution model that we run at the same time. And that's the thing that looks at all of the touch points. Um, we actually do have a time range on that one too. We look at three quarters, but everything that's happening in that account, uh, all of the different engagements and touch points and sales engagements that are going out to reach that account. And it says, you know, groups them into where they are in the life cycle. So here are all of our touch points that are really impactful for acquisition. Here are all of our touch points that are really impactful in the middle of the funnel. Here are all of the channels that really impact people to convert over into opportunities and happen kind of quickly before the, the opportunity is created. So we do have both of those views. It's almost like looking at our marketing influence versus marketing source. Both are important and they serve two different functions. And it, it's taken us a while to sort of understand that and recognize it and communicate it in a way that makes sense to other people in the organization too. Um, because I think that it can get kind of conflicting sometimes. Well, you're looking at multi-touch attribution here, but you're using your source metric here. Um, both, both make sense at different points. Okay, so um, so are there any um, uh, areas uh, within Drift that you know have some uh, impact, but you're just not fully able to track and measure ROI? And how do you deal with that? Display. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the, for sure. I think display advertising is one of the most classic examples come up, right? Because you get so what's called a view through conversion where people aren't clicking and converting right on your display ad, but they're seeing it. They're remembering it's definitely influencing their awareness of your brand, right? But then they're going on to Google, right? Or SEO, um, or even like a direct search, right? And they're activity is tracked to another channel. Um, one way that we've kind of approached that challenge here at Drift is starting with the who and getting really intentful in defining our audience, whether that's a specific account list you're looking at, right? Maybe even it's a certain group of people that have taken really high intent conversion actions on your site, kind of carve them out and kind of monitoring their progress in your funnel while your display campaign is running. Um, you can compare that to before the campaign was running too, right? You know, how is this group of accounts or these types of accounts progressing before the advertising and then after? And that can help you speak to any kind of overarching kind of view through impact the campaign is having in addition to the direct like click and impression and conversion data you're getting within your advertising platform. There are some tools that you can use too if you have something in your tech stack like Demandbase or Six Sense, Engageo. I think those types of tools are often... Uh, make it easy for you to kind of benchmark what you're seeing in terms of the breakdown of account stages before and after the launch of particular programs, even if your pipeline, pipeline isn't directly tied to that display channel, you can see, oh, we launched it on this day and here's what things look like before and after. Um, the direct mail can be kind of tough like that too, if you're, especially if you're using a top-down reporting model, like here are all the leads we generated and here's all the pipeline that came out as a result not usually generating leads from direct mail programs, you're re-engaging existing leads. So that top of funnel metric doesn't really apply there. And so you need to have a way to actually be able to translate that into pipeline or middle of funnel results. Yeah, especially when you're talking about direct mail, one like interesting thing you can do that if there is a certain kind of brand awareness display or direct mail campaign that you're investing a lot into as a marketing team, like maybe it's an ABM campaign with a really high value thing you're offering someone, you can plant like what we call like an Easter egg inside the package, right? Of like, 
you know, did you get this package? Mention this like secret word or this code um, at our booth at the next event you're going to be going to that we're sending you this for or when you're in a chat bot on our website, right? And that can trigger like a personalized experience or some sort of a higher value, like surprise and delight moment for your buyer. That way, you know, the only way people got that keyword, right? Or got to that playbook is from your brand awareness campaign or an ad they saw, something like that. Um, can be just another way to track like who actually saw that and then internalized it, remembered it and took action based on it.